Aloha and welcome. In this lesson, we're going to be discussing uh, supporting hard drives and other storage devices. This is one of, one of my favorites. Uh, I really do enjoy working with hard drives. And uh, let's just dig right in here. So um, part one, uh, we're dealing with CompTIA A plus core 1 220-1101. Um, the module objectives here are going to be, uh, by the end, we should be able to describe and contrast the technologies used inside a hard drive and how a computer communicates with a hard drive. Uh, we're going to select and install a hard drive, troubleshoot hard drives, and support optical drives, solid state storage, and flash memory devices. So hard drive technologies and interface standards. A hard disk drive, uh, HDD, most often called a hard drive, is rated by the following characteristics. Its physical size, um, the capacity, the speed, the technologies used inside the drive, and the interface standards. So um, two types of hardware technologies used inside the drive are magnetic and solid state drives. So magnetic hard drives, uh, magnetic hard drives have one, two, uh, or uh, more platters or disks that stack together and spin in unison inside a sealed metal housing. And if you look, I am showing you a picture of it. Well, kind of hard to see right now, but uh, this is a platter uh, uh, inside a hard drive. If I put it at this angle, you can kind of see it. But um, I've got, uh, this is an old IDE hard drive and it's opened up and showing you the platters. The platters individually look like wafers. They look like a CD, but they're a lot stronger and they don't bend. So uh, these are really, really strong, uh, neat uh, things. I have recently disassembled a bunch. Actually, I say I have disassembled, but uh, I had my children, some children across the hall, uh, come over and rip into about 40 old hard disks that I have. And we took out these old Torx uh, screwdrivers and uh, opened them up and then uh, looked inside them. I wanted to show the kids uh, basically like what the controller uh, part looked like. Uh, then look and see how the magnetic uh, head worked and everything else. And we can take out these really strong uh, magnets that are inside there as well. So, um, yeah, but that's, uh, these are uh, the old ones. Uh, these are the magnetic hard drives. Um, you've got firmware that controls the data reading, writing, and motherboard uh, communication. You've got this read-write head that uh, is controlled by an actuator uh, that reads it and uh, moves the, um, the head around. Uh, you've got uh, the data, it's going to be organized into concentric circles on that uh, disk, and they're called tracks, and the tracks are divided into segments called sectors. So form factors for the internal uh, magnetic hard drives are three and a half inch uh, desktop ones, uh, which is the one that I showed you uh, here. This one is a three and a half inch uh, drive, and that goes into a desktop, and usually in the front bay. Then you've got two and a half inch uh, drives are, are a little bit smaller, and those are or laptops, but you can also put them into uh, uh, drives as well. But you see right there the difference between the two. So the smaller one uh, you can uh, fit in a, in a laptop. And uh, if you have a laptop that's failed uh, and you've just decided to junk it, you can take out that little hard drive, find an enclosure for it, and use it in an external uh, USB connected uh, drive for your uh, larger system or for your desktop. Um, solid state drives. So um, solid state drives are named because they don't have any moving parts. They're built uh, using non-volatile memory and it's similar to uh, what's used in USB flash drives. So the memory in an SSD is called a NAND flash memory and a NAND is a type of operation actually. It's an AND with a NOT after it. Um, the lifespan is based on the number of write operations to the drive and it can be expressed as TBW, terabytes written or DWPD, which is drive writes per day. Uh, solid state drives are more expensive than magnetic hard drives, but they are faster, more reliable, last longer, and use less power than magnetic drives. So three popular form factors for uh, SSDs. You've got the two and a half inch SSD. You've got the M.2 SSD card. You've got the M SATA SSD and the PCI Express SSD expansion card. And here's an example with the pencil used for scale. So you've got the SSD drive uh, back there, then you've got two M2 SSDs of different sizes as well. Uh, hard drive per, uh, performance throughput is typically measured in the megabytes per second, and it describes the amount of data that flows through a point uh, to, uh, uh, through a point uh, data path over one, uh, one second's time. 
Uh, so IOPS is the input output operations per second, measures the amount of uh, read or write uh, operations performed in one second. And the latency is the measure of time required to process a data request or transaction. Uh, then we're talking about LBA, uh, logical block addressing and capacity. So the low level formatting is when the sector markers are written onto the hard drive at the factory. It's not the same thing as uh, the high level formatting that we do when we go in, we format a hard disk, totally different. Uh, the hard drive uh, firmware, the BIOS UFI uh, and the OS use logical block addressing LBA to address all hard drive sectors and the size of each block plus the total number of blocks determines the drive's capacity how much you can store on it. So we've got SMART, uh, S-M-A-R-T, and that stands for the Self-Monitoring Analysis and Reporting Technology. Uh, it's used to predict when a drive is likely to fail. Uh, if you've got like uh, uh, independent NASs like I do, um, they use SMART to let you know when you have trouble with it and you'll get emails saying, hey, we've got a drive about to fail and things like that. Um, so System BIOS uh, UFI uses SMART to monitor drive performance, the temperature and other factors. For magnetic drives, it monitors the disk spin-up time, the distance between the head and the disk, and other mechanical activities of the drive. If SMART suspects a drive failure is about to happen, it displays a warning message. Uh, in my case, with the, the network attached storage devices that I have, I'll get an email letting me know, hey, something's coming up here. Um, and that's nice because before I have a drive fail, I can go ahead and get a, a hot swap drive to replace it with. And uh, you can also enable and disable uh, SMART uh, in BIOS UFI if you don't want those messages. So um, there are different types of uh, interface standards. Uh, the older one, the ID, the integrated device ele uh, drive electronics uh, standards, uh, they allow for one to two ID connectors on a motherboard. Uh, we used to have a cable that would have two different uh, sets of notches on it. And you would have, one was the primary and the other one, well, we called the master and slave back then. And you would have a pin uh, on your, uh, you'd have a pin on your hard drives that you'd have to set for master, slave, or the second, the last one was C cell, which was a uh, cable select, which basically meant that whatever order you plugged it in, uh, that would determine which was the master and slave. I don't think that master and slave, because of the nasty history of those words, I don't think those are used anymore. Uh, but then again, neither are IDE drives, so there's that. Uh, but uh, yeah, so you had ID uh, connectors for, uh, using a 40 pin data cable. So you had uh, two types of ID cables, uh, the older one with 40 pin connector and the, uh, then the newer one that had the 40 pin connector and 80 thinner wires. Um, then you had a, a maximum recommended length of the ID cables, 18 inches. So uh, that kind of limits your spacing inside the chassis itself. Then you've also got SCSI. So you got the small computer system interface uh, standard uh, that can support up to seven or 15 SCSI compliant uh, drives in a system. The SCSI expansion card called the SCSI host adapter used a uh, PCI uh, e-slot and provide one external connector for external SCSI devices outside your system and one for internal uh, devices. So this is an example too. So you can see you've got the ID interface connected to the motherboard, but you see you have two different uh, connectors. One's connecting to the drive and the other one is open. So uh, you could connect that other one to a drive. So if you had two drives, one on top of the other in the chassis, you just plug in one and then plug in the other. And you would have to set your uh, the jumper on it to let it know which one was the first drive and which one was the second or master and slave as it was called. Or you could set it to C select, you know, the cable select. So the cable would select the order of it. So the, the one at the very end would be the master, the second one would be the slave. Um, most hard drives, uh, uh, hard drives today use the SATA interface standards to connect to a motherboard. So like I said, the, the ID one, which is like the one that I showed you here, uh, these you don't find as much anymore. Um, so uh, the SATA interface uh, standard uh, uses a serial data path and the serial uh, data cable can accommodate a single SATA drive. So instead of two, like the ID, you only have one for the SATA. Um, the three SATA standards uh, are the uh, SATA revision 3.x, uh, 2.x, and 1.x. So the SATA standards are used by all types of drives. Uh, they support hot swapping, hot plugging, which is, you know, while the thing is running, you can unplug it, which is wonderful. Uh, you don't do that with IDE drives. That would, uh, that would be a bad day. Um, and uh, the SATA drive connects to one internal SATA connector on the motherboard 
by a seven da uh, seven pin data cable. And the, the wider part of it, the 15 pin is the uh, power connector. So right side by side, you've got the 15 pin power connector and the seven pin uh, data connector. <laughs> and this is what that looks like. So here you've got your two uh, uh, connectors here. So these are the, um, if you look, you can even see it one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, the seven pins uh, for the different uh, SATA ports. So the SATA 3.2 revision allows for uh, PCIe and SATA to work together in a technology called SATA Express. The motherboard or expansion card uh, can provide external SATA, eSATA ports for external drives. So you can have drives that are you know, located outside your system. So that's kind of nice. Uh, external SATA drives use a special external shielded serial ATA cable up to two meters long. So that's about six feet. So you do have limitations in that regard. Uh, so when you're purchasing a SATA hard drive, keep following in mind, SATA standards for the drive and the motherboard need to match. That's very important. And if they don't match, your system is gonna run at the slower speed. This is a common theme in doing things. Your memory is always gonna run at the, the slower speed if you mix them. Uh, you know, your, you know, your match, when you've got your technology, like uh, whether it's USB or your SATA here, it's gonna run at the slower speed. If you're plugging in, you know, faster things to slower access, it's gonna go at the slower speed. So keep that in mind. Um, NVMEs, non-volatile memory express or NVM express interface standard is used only by SSDs. <clears throat> so comparisons between the NVME and uh, SATA, the most common SATA standard, SATA 3 transfers at six gigabytes per second. The NVME uh, uses PCIe 4.0 or PCIe 3.0, which transfers SATA at 32 gigabytes. So that's much faster, that's over five times faster and uh, eight gigabytes uh, respectively. So um, yeah, so if you're looking at that, uh, you know, PCIe 4 is much faster than uh, using SATA 3. And it's much faster than even, you know, PCIe 3. You're talking about an increase of uh, a fourfold increase between uh, uh, PCIe 3.0 and 4.0. So the PCIe uh, NVMe interface uh, might be used in three different ways. You can use a PCIe expansion card, you can use a U.2 or U.3 slot, or you can use an M.2 port. And here we have an example of a PCIe uh, X4 adapter card it provides uh, one M2 slot on it. So you can see that slot that you can plug in uh, the, uh, the adapter card or you can plug in the, uh, the memory, the SSD into. Uh, so topics covered in this part of the chapter include the following, uh, selecting a hard drive, installation details for a SATA drive, how to install a hard drive in a bay too wide for the drive, special considerations to install a hard drive in a, in a laptop, and how to set up a RAID system. <clears throat> and the RAID system details we're gonna go over are a little bit uh, weak in my opinion. There's a lot of things that you really need to consider with RAID that we don't get into, like the number of drives that you need and the number that'll, uh, you know, that you can have fail and still retain your data and everything else. It doesn't go into the detail here, but uh, we're gonna be overviewing it. So uh, selecting a hard drive, the motherboard and the hard drive must support the same interface standard. Uh, the following are some options for compatibility. SATA ports on the motherboard are usually color-coded uh, to indicate uh, which SATA standard the, board su uh, the port supports. M.2 slots might support uh, PCIe 4, PCIe 3, PCIe 2.0, SATA 2.0, X, SATA 3.0, X, or USB 3.0. When an M.2 port uh, with a card installed is using the SATA bus, one of the SATA ports might be disabled. Uh, NVMe expansion cards uh, most likely use a PCIe X4 version 3.0 or newer slot. Other considerations when selecting a hard drive, uh, your technology, the form factor, the capacity, the data transfer rate is determined by the uh, drive interface. And for magnetic drives, the spindle speed, which affects your performance. And that, you know, you'll see that like 7,200 RPMs, 5,400 RPMs. Uh, that's the type of thing you'll see there. Uh, a SATA drive might have jumpers used to set features such as the ability to power up from standby mode. If jumpers are present on a SATA drive, the factory has set them as they should be. Don't tamper with this. Uh, some SATA drives uh, have two power connectors. Choose only one power connector to be used. Never install two power cords to the same drive at the same time. Uh, big important thing there. So here is the back of a drive, uh, the, rear of, uh, the rear of a SATA drive with two power connectors. You see over there at the far left-hand side, you've got the, the power connector 
which is the wider one, uh, the 15 pin, and you've got the seven pin, uh, the data connector. And then going on, you've got the jumper bank, which is set at the factory. Don't mess with that. You used to have these on ID drives and that was made to set up your uh, primary, your secondary uh, or cable select. Don't mess with this jumper. And then beside that, we have what we call a four pin Molex connector. And that's the old style uh, <laughs> uh, power uh, connector. So you'll still see in, with uh, some uh, power supplies, you'll see a, a four pin as well as your, uh, your uh, other types of uh, power connectors like for SATA. But the four pin is, uh, I think it's called Molex. So uh, steps install a SATA drive as best as you can protect the user's data. This goes without saying back up important data, other media and verify that you can access the data on that media because it doesn't mean anything to back it up if you don't know that you did it properly and that you can access the data afterwards. So verify that you can access the data and actually use it. Um, know your starting point. How's your system configured? Is everything working properly? That's kind of a no brainer. Uh, read the documentation and prepare your work area. Read all the instructions, uh, installation instructions, visualize all the steps, uh, steps that are uh, in that installation. Then in installing the drive, you're gonna shut down the computer, unplug it, press the power button to uh, drain the residual power. This is, we've talked about this a million times. Uh, decide which bay is gonna hold your drive. Uh, you're gonna find different places. In some places, it'll be up in the front. You'll have like, if you've got optical drives, there'll be spaces down there. Sometimes it'll be on the outside of the chassis. Uh, in that bay area, you may have an outside area that you can put the a smaller SSD drive against it like that. Sometimes it'll be on the floor of the chassis. There's different places for it. Just find out where your, uh, you know, where your chassis will uh, hold a drive. Then you'll slide the bay in uh, the drive into the bay and secure it. Uh, if it's the old style, like the three and a half inch, it goes in the front. Uh, you'll be uh, securing the screws on the side. Sometimes you'll just have rails that go inside and it'll, uh, it'll just slide in and pop into place. The rail parts will pop out. It'll be great. Um, use the correct motherboard SATA connector. That goes without saying. Uh, connect a 15 pin SATA or four pin Molex. There we go, four pin Molex power connector from the power supply to the drive. Depending on what your drive, old IDEs or uh, Molex, the SATA drives, of course, use the 15 pin uh, SATA power connector. Uh, check all connections and power up the system and verify that the drive is recognized correctly when you're using BIOS uh, UEFI. I think that's less of an issue nowadays. In the old days, <laughs> when uh, this was a little bit more archaic, when you're looking at your BIOS, you may have it coming up, uh, not being recognized. So uh, yeah, I think this is less of a concern now, but do uh, double check anyway, make sure it's identifying it as the right type of drive. And here we have uh, different uh, tabs that are used to secure the drive uh, within your chassis. And you can see, um, you can see the drive hanging there. It's not really hanging there, but uh, you've got these uh, tabs that you can use to, to connect it on the sides. And this is an example of the 15 pin, uh, uh, the, uh, the power cord for the SATA. And it's uh, the one that's plugged in already is the data connector. The one all the way down at the end, that's the, uh, the power. And you never have to worry about uh, hooking one up to the other. It's keyed as well, so you have this little I wouldn't say it's an L, but it's kind of like an L shape. It's got a little lip and then it goes down like this. So you're not gonna make a mistake there. Uh, so uh, installing a drive in a removable bay, unplug the cage fan from its power source, turn the handle on each locking device counterclockwise to remove it, slide the bay to the front and out of the case, insert the hard drive in the bay and use two screws on each side to anchor the drive in the bay, slide the bay back into the case, reinstall the locking pins, uh, plug in the cage fan power cord. Uh, this is pretty straightforward stuff. And here you have a very old, old looking uh, bracket. <laughs> and uh, this is a universal bay kit to uh, make the drive fit in the bay. So you'll notice that this is a little bit wider. Uh, it's a three and a half inch uh, drive, but the, the rails there on the side that are uh, you know, set up to allow it to um, fit into a space that's a little bit too wide. So uh, yeah, haven't seen one of these in a long time and usually it's on a much older system. So installing an M2 uh, SSD card. So read the motherboard manual to find out the types of M.2 cards the board supports. Do the following to install the card, uh, measure the length of the card and decide 
which screw hole for the M2 uh, slot the card requires. Then you're gonna slide the card straight into the slot, but not from an upward angle. Uh, you can install the one screw in the standoff uh, to secure the card to the motherboard. Then uh, start the system. Uh, like before, go into the BIOS UEFI setup, and make sure that M.2 card is recognized by the system. So for a laptop, the general steps to replace a hard drive in a laptop are as follows. You're gonna power down the system, remove the peripherals and remove the battery pack. You don't want anything connected to your system really. <clears throat> um, and you don't want your, uh, you know, your battery you know, running power to it. So you're gonna remove the screw that holds the drive cover in place. There's usually a, a separate uh, cover for the drive. If you're dealing with a Mac, God bless you, uh, this isn't gonna go well. Um, Remove the plastic cover from the drive and lift uh, and remove the hard drive. Then you're gonna insert the new drive in the bay, replace the cover and the screw, then power up the system. The BIOS UEFI should recognize the new drive and search for an OS. If uh, the drive is new, you're gonna to need to boot from the Windows setup or recovery DVD or USB flash drive and install the OS onto it. And this is what it looks like. Uh, these are, you know, what uh, the, uh, the hard drive space on a, uh, on a PC laptop looks like, and you'll just put that in there and then you'll cover it up with the plastic shield and you know, screw it back in or screw the, uh, the cover back on. But it's usually an easy affair to, to get those out. Um, the Mac is different. So now we're gonna talk about RAID, hardware RAID. So RAID is a redundant array of inexpensive disks. Inexpensive is a very relative term there because never in my life have I put in a disk thinking, wow, that was cheap. Uh, usually for me, it's hundreds of dollars and it always hurts when you have to replace one. So um, RAID is a technology that configures two or more hard drives to work together as an array of drives. So why do you wanna do that? Well, one is performance and the other is fault tolerance. So uh, performance is when you can uh, break your stuff up across drives uh, and it's gonna give you a performance uh, uh, boost in that uh, there's striping and things like that that we use. Uh, for fault tolerance, because you're, uh, you can uh, mirror uh, drives and have it uh, running from one to the other. And that's good in case one of the hard drives fails. And I've had this happen many times. I've had probably six different types. I've had D-Link, uh, DNS 323, 343, Synologies, uh, all kinds of stuff. And uh, hard drives fail. And I found uh, for a lot of my setups, I like to have uh, mirrored drives, not necessarily RAID 5. RAID 5 does eat up a lot of, uh, uh, eat, uh, it eats up uh, more drives than I like. And uh, I normally find that uh, I don't need this. I'm, I don't care about the boost in performance. Some people do. And for those applications, RAID 5 is much better. But for me, I've often used uh, just mirroring. So um, uh, spanning is when we have two hard drives to hold a single uh, Windows volume. So in other words, you have many drives and you span the volume across it all. So uh, when one drive is full, data can be written to another one. So you're not limited. Let's say you had a four, uh, four terabyte drive. Uh, if you had another one, you could actually have uh, an eight terabyte drive uh, just by spanning across the two. Uh, the different RAID types, there's more RAID types than this out there. Uh, there's a lot more, but um, to Give you an example, a RAID 0 writes the physical disks evenly across all the disks so that no one disk receives all the activities. Um, this gives you a performance boost, uh, but it doesn't give you any type of fault tolerance. Uh, RAID 1 actually duplicates, RAID 1 is called mirroring and it duplicates data on one drive to another drive and it's used for fault tolerance. So if one drive dies, you've got the other one. Uh, notice that if something goes wrong to the whole unit, you know, and it's, yeah, you've got a different issue there, but uh, it'll, it, that saves you in the case that one drive dies, uh, one drive dies, and I've had that happen on more than one occasion. Uh, RAID 5 is going to stripe the data across drives and use parity checking and data uh, is not duplicated. The thing to note about that is, I think this is it, uh, you can have up to one drive die and you can replace that with any loss, without any loss of data, but I think it requires I wanna say three or more drives. I'll have to double check on that, but uh, that may be in the extra reading. Then you've got RAID 10. RAID 10 is a combination of uh, RAID 1 and RAID 0 and takes at least four disks and data is mirrored across pairs of disks. And there's uh, other styles of this out there as well. And there's 
other proprietary standards for uh, RAID types as well. But these are the basic ones. <clears throat> so implementing hardware RAID, uh, hardware RAID can be set up using a RAID enabled motherboard that is managed in uh, BIOS UFI uh, setup or by using a RAID controller card. Uh, for best RAID performance, all hard drives in an array should be identical in brand, size, speed, and other features. It is okay to have a drive that's larger than your other drives, but what you need to remember is that larger drive, it's only gonna use the amount of the smaller drives. So again, you know that situation where having more, faster, whatever, it's gonna go down to this, you know, this, the, the weakest link is gonna be the one that drives it. So if you have, you know, three two terabyte drives in there and your fourth one is a eight terabyte drive, you're still gonna be going at the size of your smallest one for your, uh, for your volumes there. So keep that in mind. Um, if Windows is to be installed on a RAID hard drive, RAID must be implemented before you install Windows. That's something important to keep in mind. I do not have any instances where I have done that, but this is something to keep in mind. Uh, general directions to install a RAID 5 array using three matching SATA drives. So you're gonna install the drives in the computer case and connect each drive to the motherboard. Then you're gonna boot the system and enter BIOS UEFI to uh, verify that drives are recognized. That's important. Then you're gonna select the option to configure SATA and select RAID. Uh, when the system reboots, enter BIOS UEFI on the advanced page. Then you're gonna select Intel Rapid Storage Technology and then create RAID volume. Under RAID level, choose RAID 5 if you want RAID 5 and then you can do the stripe size as well. Uh, enter the size of the volume that you want on there, the size of the, the drive, and then you can uh, select create the volume to complete the RAID configuration. Um, for a knowledge check here, uh, if you've got four hard drives on hand, you need a replacement for a desktop system. Documentation for the motherboard installed in the system says the board has six SATA three gigabyte connectors and one ID connector. Which of the four hard drives will work in the system and yield the best performance? Uh, all right, there's a hint in here and it's best performance. So if we look at that, uh, we see that the IDE would work in there and sure it would work in there, but is that best performance? Uh, think not. SATA is gonna be faster than IDE and perform better. So let's look, we've got the uh, Western Digital 7200 RPM SATA, uh, the 3.0, we've got the IDE, uh, ATA 4500 RPM, and we've got the WD 4500 RPM SATA with uh, six gigs, uh, 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 six gigabytes per second. So when we look at those, what's gonna be the highest performing in there? Well, let's think about it. Uh, the ID, I think we can throw out because sure we can connect it, but it's not gonna be the best one. And if we look at the other three in here, what's gonna be the best performing uh, SATA drive that we have in there? So uh, is it gonna be the, oh wait, uh, sorry, we've got two IDs in there. So we can throw both of those out there. Then we've got the uh, SATA revision 3.0 and we've got the SATA six uh, gigabyte uh, per second. So it's uh, down to one or the other. Uh, hold on, uh, it's a desktop system. So uh, we know that the 3.5 is designed for that. We've got a 7200 uh, RPM SATA. So I'm gonna go with B here. So the answer is B, all drives will work in the system. For best performance, choose the fastest interface standard the board supports, B and D, and the fastest RPM, the tiebreaker between B and D. And uh, yeah, if we're looking at this being a laptop and not a desktop, then we'd have to choose D because the B uh, option 3.5 inch disc would not fit in it. So that's the thing to keep in mind there. So now troubleshooting hard drives. This is fun, not fun. Uh, hard drives uh, are finicky and when they die, they die spectacularly and they hold our most precious moments. So we, uh, this is a very, very uh, difficult subject in that sense. Um, so anyway, problems caused by hard drives uh, during the boot can be caused by the following. Hard drive subsystem, the file system on the drive, files required by Windows when it begins to load, so when trying to solve a problem with the uh, boot, decide if the problem is caused by hardware or software. So one of the most uh, common complaints about a computer is that it is running slowly. The overall performance of a system depends on the individual performance of the processor, the motherboard, memory, and hard drive. To optimize a drive, you can use Windows tools 
or tools provided by the hard drive manufacturer. Um, you can diagnose the hard uh, drive performance, use a hard drive uh, speed test utility, such as disk speed. Uh, you can use the uh, Windows defrag and optimization tool uh, to optimize the hard drive. Note that that's not for uh, SSDs. Um, but uh, yeah, getting back to, there was something up there that I saw, um, a computer uh, with the disk running uh, slowly. One other thing to keep in mind too there is that uh, if your system is running slowly, uh, you can also check and see if your memory is uh, used to the fullest. Uh, if you're pegging out your memory too, one thing that's gonna be happening is you're gonna be swapping out to virtual uh, memory on disk and that can cause performance issues that may mimic that as well. So just uh, keep that in mind. So here's uh, examples of uh, optimizing your drives. You can look and it says Windows reports the volume C is trimmed and volume D is not fragmented. So uh, you know that gives you some uh, hints there. Defragmenting a drive is how you can compact. Uh, you know if you've got you know files that are spread all over the disk, you can uh, basically unfragment them and put them all together so that you don't have as much jumping around uh, as you go to read it from the disk. <clears throat> so migrating data to a new SSD and a laptop. Here's a jump of topic, but uh, to perform a migration, complete the following steps. Install the cloning software on your laptop. Then you're going to attach a SATA to USB data transfer cable to a USB port on your laptop. So you have on your laptop the USB port, you're going to plug it in, then it's going to do SATA on the other end. So on the other end, you're going to attach the new uh, SSD to that SATA end of it. And you're going to follow the on-screen uh, on screen instructions in your cloning software to complete the data migration. In other words, you're going to uh, you're probably going to take that and just clone it over. Uh, we used to have a, something called Ghost in the old days that did that. Um, then you're going to remove the old hard drive, and then you're going to take the new SSD and you're going to pop that into the laptop. And all this is, of course, assuming that you don't have problems with that hard drive that made it unreadable or something like that, because cloning it may or may not do any good in that sense. So um, then you're gonna install drive management software from the SSD manufacturer. Make sure that everything uh, stays working nicely. Um, so hard drive problems during the boot. Uh, hardware problems usually show up at post. So if BIOS UEFI cannot access the drive, the cause might be the drive, the drive cable, the electrical system, the motherboard or a loose connection. Uh, things to do to check before opening the case, check to see if the BIOS UEFI displays <coughs> a numeric code or other message during the post. If it does, then that can give you something to look up to uh, use as a hint. So check the BIOS UEFI setup for errors in the hard drive configuration. Uh, usually when we install it, we check for things like that, but you know, if something happens in the meantime, go ahead and check that again, make sure it's still recognizing it. Uh, you can try booting it from another type of bootable media like a USB stick or something uh, and run tools off of that. And then for arrayed array, uh, use the firmware utility to check the status of each disk in the array and check for errors. Um, the following are a few of several things that can be tried if the uh, problem is still not solved. Remove and attach all drive cables, uh, remove and reattach them. Uh, sometimes you may, you know, perhaps over time it's loosened itself if there's any vibrations or anything like that, or if you, God forbid, drop it or something, you could have a cable work loose. Uh, not often a solution, but it is a possibility. Uh, if you're using a RAID or SATA controller card, remove and reseat it or place it in a different slot in case your slot is going bad. Uh, inspect the drive for damage. Uh, that's important. Uh, also remember, uh, as time goes on and you get dust into your system, if that dust uh, builds up around the drive, you could smother it too. You could, uh, you could uh, have things go wrong with it. So uh, particularly for me, once or twice a year, I will open up my NAS and I will reduce it. I, I will take it all apart down to the bare bones and I will blow it out and I will dust it out as much as I can because a lot of dust accumulates in there. And it's just, it's a sad fact of life, but you've got fans on it, but those fans still, you know, you've got dust that accumulates and it's important to keep that thing, you know, very nice and ventilated. So uh, yeah, dust accumulation is something to be careful of there. And they don't list it here, but I've uh, 
I found that killing one or two drives uh, of mine in the past, particularly in my uh, network attached storage array. Um, so you're gonna inspect that drive for damage, determine if the hard drive is spinning by listening to it. The ID drives and the SATA drives, one thing that we could do is we could attach it to the cable with everything open and we'd start up the computer and you could hold it like this and you can feel the, um, you know, you can feel the gyroscopes inside it, you know, actually, you know, if you move your hand like this, oops, you can't see it, but if you move your hand like this, you could feel it uh, spinning and you could feel it, uh, you know, like a gyroscope in a way. Uh, so uh, you can tell that it's, you know, that it's running uh, if you're doing that. And you can tell uh, sometimes if things are going badly, you can hear that process. Normally, if your hard drive is running well, you're not going to hear much. But when things, if you're hearing clicking sounds or, you know, scratching sounds or anything like that, that's bad news. And usually that's total failure. And what's happening is, your uh, your head or your head inside there is having trouble, and it's you know it's uh, messing. It's essentially uh, scraping on the platters, and it is still possible to have things like that uh, fixed. But you're going to have to send it to a, a place that does repair specifically on hard drives. You're going to have a clean room. They're going to take it apart and uh, totally go through it, and uh, you can recover data, but of course you don't want to be reusing those drives in the future. But um, the amount that you can recover is very questionable at that point. Um, checking cables for frayed edges, never in my entire life have I ever had that issue. So I can't really uh, say whether that is a valid one, but sure, uh, if you have a cut or a nick in the side of a cable, that could cause issues, although I've never seen it. Um, Check your installation manual. Uh, smart errors mean data should be backed up and drive or replaced as soon as possible. This is absolutely uh, crucial. If you've got data on these drives, you should back them up. Um, I have a network attached storage here. I also keep one offsite, so I copy between the two. But um, yeah, when you start to get a, a smart error, that means it's time to replace it. So. I've got four bay enclosures and I have a fifth drive that I keep in a box. And that fifth drive is there for when one of those dies because if I have to order it from Amazon, it takes four or five days to get out here. Uh, that RAID may be working less effectively. It will be working less effectively if that one drive is not usable. So do yourself a favor, always keep a spare hot swappable drive. So if one starts to go bad, don't even question it, just pull it out and stick it in there. Uh, this is an expense. Yeah, you're buying an extra drive. You know, there goes two or 300 extra dollars. It's a pain to have to do that, but it will save your life. It'll save your data when uh, the time comes and the time will come. So just know that. <coughs> so um, hard drive problems during the boot, uh, you'll select the command prompt where you can execute the check this command. And the check this command is uh, with all kinds of different options on it. You can do things like, you know, read it, uh, repair it, things like that, repair if possible. So supporting other types of uh, storage devices, um, file systems uh, that other uh, types of storage devices use. Uh, uh, we're also gonna cover um, types of storage devices such as optical disks, USB flash drives and memory cards. And I am constantly reminded by my children, they have no idea what optical disks are, the idea of DVDs and Blu-rays and everything else are kind of foreign to them. So I, yeah, I do have in my system, it's kind of funny. So uh, two work systems ago, we didn't even have optical drives. And for some reason, our new one that we have, uh, it has an optical drive, even though nobody uses uh, any type of optical drives anymore in our company. I've not actually seen one, so anyhow. So file systems used by storage devices. File system is the overall structure the OS uses to name, store, and organize files on a drive. In Windows, each store, uh, storage device is assigned a drive letter, and, is, which, and it's called a volume. So using Windows to install a new file system on a device or a uh, logical uh, drive, it's called formatting. So you're formatting it to you know, the drive uh, with a certain type of uh, file system. Those file systems are like NTFS, uh, XFAT, <laughs> FAT32, and FAT and CDFS or UDF. And uh, 
if you're, there's a lot of things to consider here. Uh, NTFS uh, uses a, a ledger and it's uh, essentially, uh, or a log and it, it, uh, it's a little bit uh, better in terms of recovery. Uh, you've got XFAT and FAT32 and there's things about those that make them usable between uh, different types of systems. Like if you're working with uh, Mac and uh, Windows, yeah, that's something to consider. Uh, you wanna use something that you know both of them can support if you're gonna be moving it back and forth between those systems. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot of things to consider in there. So CDs, DVDs, and BDs, the Blu-ray discs, uh, use laser technologies. Uh, they have little tiny lands and pits on the surface uh, represented, uh, that represent bits read by a laser beam. And uh, yeah, this technology, uh, back in the day, it was, it was extremely wonderful, uh, but there's limitations to it. CDs could only hold like, I think it was something like 640, 640 megabytes. And uh, then, you know, DVDs would give you, you know, hey, a couple, you know, gigs and Blu-rays would be many more. But, you know, compared to our USB sticks, which even the USB sticks are, you know, the flash drives are going away. Most things are streamed these days. Um, so, uh, yeah, optical discs are just sadly going away. But uh, anyway, uh, data is written uh, only to one side of a CD. So uh, you can uh, you can be uh, written on both sides of a DVD or a Blu-ray disc. So DVD or Blu-ray discs, they can hold data in two layers on each side. So that gives you a lot more storage capacity than the CDs. And here is a graphic example of it. Moving on. So optical drives and burners, Blu-ray drives are backwards compatible with uh, DVD and CD uh, technologies. DV drives are uh, backwards compatible with CD technologies. Um, but uh, yeah, depending on the drive features, an optical drive might be able to read and write to Blu-rays, uh, DVDs, and CDs. And then a drive that can uh, write to discs is commonly called a burner. So uh, yeah, often you'll have the, you'll think you have a burner and you don't, and you're going to write something out and you're like, hey, wait a second. You know, I, I'm, I wanna burn something out, but it's not working. And you notice that, so oh, you've only got a reader and not a writer. So yeah, but uh, burners nowadays, they're not that expensive. Back in the old days, you know, getting a burner was much more expensive than you know, just something that would read. Um, today's internal optical drive uh, interface with the motherboard, uh, it's, uh, it's a SATA connection. Uh, back in the old days, it was IDE. Um, and you, know, you combine like an optical drive and a, a hard drive on the, same, uh, on the same IDE. One would be like the master, the other would be the slave. And then you'd have settings, you'd all have jumpers on the back of it that you'd have to set. Uh, so an external drive uh, might use eSATA or the USB port if you're going to if you're going to connect your optical drive externally. Uh, internal optical drives on today's computers use a SATA interface uh, as opposed to IDs in the old days, as I mentioned. Optical drives uh, usually installed in the drive bay at the top of a desktop case. That's just the primary one they've always been at. Uh, it doesn't matter. You can you know you can put them lower, but often they're up at the top. Uh, after it's installed in the bay, connect the data in the power cables. Duh. Uh, Windows supports optical drives using its own embedded drives without add-on drivers, which is kind of nice. Uh, used to be that you'd have to have one matched up to the manufacturer, no longer necessary. When Windows first starts after the drive installs, it's going to recognize the drive and it's going to install the drivers automatically for you. And you can use uh, Device Manager to verify that the drive uh, is installed with no errors. If it has an error, it's going to have that little yellow uh, exclamation mark beside it. So solid state storage, uh, types of solid state uh, storage includes SSDs, USB flash drives and memory cards. Uh, you'll remember, let me hold it up for you. Uh, things like, oh, that's not working so well. Uh, this is, you've got an SD uh, adapter for an S, uh, the SDHC, uh, the micro USB. Then you've got these things, the, um, the flash memory sticks that you can just kind of Stick in. <laughs> um, USB flash drives go by many names, including a flash pen drive, jump drive, thumb drive, key drive. Flash drives might be USB 2, USB 3, and use FAT or XFAT file system. Windows has embedded drivers to support the flash drives. Uh, going back to the USB 2 and 3, again, this is something that drives me absolutely nuts. So your USB technologies have different speeds and they're usually represented by different colors. 
So when you're looking at your, and I don't know why uh, PC manufacturers do this, but often you'll have different uh, USB two and three mixed on your motherboard. And you'll have like the USB three in the front, then you'll have USB two and three on the back, something like that. So make sure that when you're using your external drives that you're matching them, because as we said before, when you're mixing your different types of USB two, if you've got a USB two port and you're plugging a USB three, uh, device, you're thinking, hey, I'm going to have USB three speeds. I'm going to be able to, you know, uh, move files really quickly. And no, you're you're dropping down to USB two. <clears throat> Another thing to look out for is pricing. Uh, if you're buying uh, these cheap, uh, you know, cheap uh, USB uh, flash drives, at places like Best Buy, you're going to find them. Hey, they've got a great sale on it. But you're going to notice that even now they're probably selling USB two O technology. All these years later, we've had so much faster for so long and they're still selling old ancient things there. So you take that home and think, hey, I'll just plug it in my USB three connector. And you find you're connecting it, you know, you're moving files at USB two speeds. And that's just too painful nowadays with uh, the size of our files that we work with and the slowness of USB two. So do remember that again, you know, mixing your speeds with USB is a painful thing. Don't do that. <laughs> and also using FAT and XFAT, uh, be careful because you've got file size limitations with that and you've got drive size limitations. So uh, you're not going to have certain options available when you've got a, a really large uh, drive or a really large USB drive. So uh, make sure that uh, you, know, you don't hit those uh, file or the limitations there. So memory cards uh, might be used in uh, digital cameras tablets, smartphones, MP3 players. Uh, again, we're dating ourselves here. MP3 players, who uses those anymore? Nobody really. Um, digital camcorders and other portable devices. Most laptops have memory card slots uh, provided by a built-in smart flash reader. <coughs> or if you're like me and you've got a Mac and you have to use dongles and everything, you'll often get the, um, I use on a lot of my drones and, uh, action cameras and stuff. I use a micro, I, um, uh, the micro USB. And when you're, uh, when you're using this, the SDHC, uh, you'll get an adapter with it. And we just plug this into an SD uh, reader. So that's always an option. Um, most laptops have memory card slots provided by a built-in smart card reader. That is true, unless you have a Mac. Uh, secure digital cards, SD cards are uh, the most popular brand. Uh, like I was showing you just a second ago, I've got the um, the uh, SDUC, uh, the or not the SDUC, the SDXC, or the SDHC, sorry. Um, so the standards for the capacities used uh, are the, uh, for SDs are the 1.x, the regular SD, the 2.x, which is the SD high capacity, or SDHC, um, the 3.x, which is the extended capacity, and the 7.x, which is the ultra capacity. So SD cards uh, come in three physical sizes. They've got the full size. Full size would be uh, like this here, the, the black uh, thing you see here. You've got the minis and then you've got the micros. This is the micro right here. So uh, the SD slots are backwards compatible with the SD cards. Um, the uh, Unfortunately, you can't use the SDHC card in an SD uh, slot. You cannot use the SDXD card in the SDHC or SD spot. But of course, you can use, like for the SDHC, you can use the adapters to, to uh, do that. Um, uh, also, you can only use SDUC cards and SDUC slots. So, um, let me go to the next slide. So, you want to install an SSD in your uh, desktop computer. Oh, this is our knowledge check. You want to install an SSD in your desktop computer, but the uh, drive is far too narrow to fit snugly into the bays of your computer case. Which of the following do you do? You install it into a laptop, laptop computer. No, that's not an option we want in our desktop. Buy a bay adapter that will only allow you, or that will allow you to install the narrow drive in a desktop case. That sounds good to me. Then it says this SSD is designed for a laptop. Flash, blah, 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 uh, will support a laptop hard drive. Um, uh, that doesn't make any sense. So use a special SATA controller uh, card that will support the you know, hard drive. 
So uh, go with the buy a, a bay adapter that'll allow you to. And we showed a picture of that earlier with the, the two metal pieces on the side. So I'm going to say B. And yes, B is the answer. Uh, we're going to be buying that bay adapter on the side. So, all right. Uh, so now that the lesson's over, you should be able to describe and contrast the technologies used inside a hard drive and how a computer communicates with a hard drive. You're going to be able to select the uh, select and install a hard drive. You're going to be able to troubleshoot it, like we said with the smart and the check disk and things like that. You're going to be able to support optical drives, even though nobody does or needs to, but we'll just say it. Yeah, you're going to be able to select, uh, support optical drives, solid state drives, and flash memory uh, devices. And one of the things I've talked about between this memory and a lot of other things, uh, always make sure that your technologies match up. Always make sure that your speeds, your different things like that match because you're gonna be throttled by the, the weakest link there or the slowest speed that you're dealing with. So uh, keep that in mind. And that concludes our uh, chapter here. So um, anyway, if you have any questions, reach out and I'd be uh, happy to help. Have a great day.